Excellent. Thanks, John. So um, thanks, everybody, for jumping on. We've got uh, a lot of people online, which is great. Um, thanks, everybody, for, for, uh, for joining us. This is the first of our um, now, I guess, semi-regular weekly seminars in the Center for Imaging Science um, that will be happening by Zoom this, this year. Um, we'll continue to advertise them as broadly as we can. Um, we're very fortunate today, um, our very own John Karakas, who's been a professor here at RIT for several years, he applied for and last year was granted a sabbatical after being awarded a position as a Jefferson Science Fellow at the U.S. Department of State. Um, and so John was there for um, essentially August to August. Um, and even though he was sort of kicked out of his State Department August office, just like the rest of us were back in March, um, he did some amazingly cool things while he was there. Um, and so uh, our seminar season this semester is going to be kicked off by John giving us a rundown on what he did over the over his year as a Jefferson Science Fellow. I'm sure John is probably going to talk to it as well, but I just wanted to relay um, from the provost that the, uh, the call for applications for the Jefferson Science Fellow is currently out. And I believe those applicants are due in uh, approximately the middle of October. Um, so, John, um, tell us about your last year. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Dave, and thanks to everyone for joining today. Looks like we've got a good crowd of almost 60 folks, and uh, hopefully, as with all talks that I give, I like everyone who intends to walk away feeling like they learned something from the talks. So that's the objective today. And as Dave mentioned, I spent the last year as a Jefferson Science Fellow down at the Department of State and I'll be telling you about my experiences. So let's go ahead and get started. And if I can go ahead and advance this, figure this out. So it all started when I was reflecting on how should I spend my next sabbatical uh, about two, little over two years ago, I started thinking about this. And I started thinking about what are the different ways that you can spend a sabbatical? I could stay in Rochester and catch up on a long to-do list, all kinds of work that could be done. But the last time I did a sabbatical, that's sort of what I did. I went over to U of R and spent some time there, and it was a great experience, but I spent a lot of time back at RIT. Rochester's a beautiful city. There's a nice little advertising photo from the uh, folks, but I, I've been there and done that. So I thought about, well, what else could I do? And one thing that I've always thought about is possibly writing a, a, a textbook, and I'm going to talk about that briefly, and I could be an esoteric uh, textbook, but it's a lot of work, and you see the picture on the left there. I came back a couple weeks ago to check on my mail, and I went into my office, and this is what I found. <laughs> and, uh, don't worry, nobody was hurt, nothing was damaged, but the wall anchors seemed to have given away, and the bookshelves all fell down, and all my magazines, over 30 years collection, just all fell. And it's probably a good thing that I wasn't working on my book in my office because this big, nice piece of wood would have fallen on my head. So <laughs> it could have been dangerous to do that. But anyway, I, you know, another option would have been to go so far away. Over the years, I've developed a nice international network of colleagues and have many open invitations to spend time in places like Grenoble or in Israel or Australia. Uh, I did get to travel to Greece and I uh, spent a little time at the Acropolis there this past fall and so that was nice, but I decided not to do that as well. Another option would have been to take the more safe route and spend some time with uh, sponsors at NASA. I've worked a lot with the Landsat program and that could have been good and interesting and helpful for YouTube, but it more or less is kind of the same old, same old. So what did I end up doing? Something kind of wild and crazy and say, well, let's go work at a government agency devoted to international diplomacy, which I really didn't know much about. And so that's what I applied for. And as Dave mentioned, I was fortunate enough to be accepted and everything went through. And I started last August at the Harry S. Truman Building, which is the main state building. So with that, I'm going to tell you about life as a science fellow in a diplomatic world, hopefully over the next 35, 40 minutes and leave time for some questions. So this is what I will talk about today. I want to give a brief overview of the Jefferson Science Fellows Program, talk about the Department of State, how it's organized, and then where I was placed, and which happened to be with the Green Diplomacy Initiative, and I'll tell you more about that later. And then 
I will go into what I did day to day, and most of my talk will be about the work I did supporting their air quality monitoring needs and how they might be met by satellite observations. For those of you who may not know my background, I've worked for over 30 years in the, uh, satellite remote sensing, and so that's my, my specialty in imaging science. And then about, I'll explain a few other topics that I worked on while I was in DC, and I'll have a little bit of a travel log and a, and a picture show as well. And then I'm gonna wrap up by just explaining a little bit about some opportunities that I came across for our students and our graduates, potential full-time employment, as well as faculty fellowships, including the Jefferson Science Program. And the last thing is just to summarize with a few comments on what I learned during my year at the State Department. So moving on to the fellowship program, it's named after Thomas Jefferson, who was the first Secretary of State and happened to be the third president. He wrote the Declaration of Independence, and he had a nice background in, as an inventor, and he knows a little bit about science. He founded the University of Virginia. He sold his book collection to start the Library of Congress. Now, he, he wasn't so philanthropic. He actually was in debt quite a bit. And so he used that money to pay off some of his debts. And I, I learned a little bit about this from this nice uh, children's book on the right here, who was Thomas Jefferson. One of my Jefferson Science Fellows colleagues bought a set of these books to share. And so it's kind of fun to, to read through about that. Now, the program itself was established in 2003 by Secretary of State Colin Powell at the time. It's run by the National Academies. And each year, 10 to 12 fellows are selected uh, last year, I show on the left pictures of my class, my fellow fellows, and the top row were all placed at USAID, the United States Agency for International Development, and the bottom row were placed at the Department of State. And we got to spend a lot of time together, and it was a wonderful opportunity to meet colleagues from across the country who came from varied backgrounds such as geography and biology, and physics, uh, sociology, quite a variety of sciences. Uh, the program gives a stipend and travel allowance, and I put a little quote down here that we would often say, it was like being in grad school where we were able to focus on kind of a single set of topics and, and really kind of go all in in a new area, but we actually had money <laughs> and we weren't a poor student, and so we could go out to nice dinners and so on. Now, the Department of State is actually the oldest uh, cabinet agency, founded in 1789, and the mission, as stated here, really does capture what they do. They lead America's foreign policy through diplomacy, advocacy, and assistance, and you can read the rest. There's about 75,000 employees, but 50,000 of those or, or so are locally employed staff that are from the country where we have an embassy or consulate located. So there's quite a lot of uh, foreign nationals that are employed as part of the Department of State. There are more than 270 embassies and consulates in 180 countries. And the state budget is about 50 billion, which is 1% of the federal budget. But two thirds of that goes out to foreign assistance through USAID and other programs. And if you're interested in learning more about the State Department, there's a couple of websites which you can easily, easily write down and, and uh, look at your own interest. The foreignassistance.gov explains what the United States does with this foreign assistance in terms of humanitarian, security, uh, helping countries, and so on. So there's, there's a lot of good information there. Now, this is an org chart, and I don't expect people to read through it all and study it, but I just wanted to point out how the Department of State is organized. It's headed by the Secretary of State, which is currently Mike Pompeo, and then there are a number of undersecretaries, and what you might notice if you can see, depending on how large your screen is, each of the, the secretary and the undersecretaries have a single letter. And so when people refer to the secretary, they don't say Secretary or Pompeo, they say S. Or if they're referring to the undersecretary for management, it's M. And it's interesting, the, the jargon and the acronyms. Oh my gosh, the acronyms at the Department of State. It's far worse than any other environment that I've ever been in. And in fact, 
the science fellows recently for the incoming class of new fellows put together a whole list, many pages of acronyms to help them learn. Now, in this um, organization, I was placed in the Office of Management Strategy and Solutions. And so just real briefly, once I became a finalist, I, my name and package was sent around to the various offices who were interested in hosting a Jefferson Science Fellow. And then they selected who of the finalists they wanted to interview. I interviewed with nine different offices, eight in the state, one in USAID, including one of the places I interviewed was with T. Uh, at that time, it was Andrea Thompson, who's the Undersecretary for Arms Control and International Security Affairs. And it was quite a nice interview because we were able to go into her office where she has this a fireplace and multiple couches and carpet. <laughs> it, was, it was quite nice. Uh, while I'm thinking it, I've just mentioned that the secretaries, undersecretaries and the secretary are all located on the seventh floor of the main state building. And so people will often refer to, well, the seventh floor has to approve that. And that's, that's the highest level of the Department of State. I also had a chance, uh, well, just to say a little bit more about the State Department, all our embassies and consulates uh, have liaisons back in Washington under these regional bureaus. We divide the world up into six regions. Uh, many people interact with the Department of State through uh, visas, and that's located in the Consular Affairs, which is actually part of the Undersecretary of Management. And then the rest of these organizations all support. One thing I wanted to mention is the Department of State is very hierarchical. There's a lot of respect given and permissions and approvals that have to go up the chain. And then I learned a new world called uh, equity in this context. Whenever you wanted to publish something or release a cable, you had to get approved and cleared by other uh, bureaus or offices that may have an equity or an interest in the topic. And so there's a lot of horizontal interact, interaction and a lot of communication that occurs. The other part of the State Department I spent some time with was the, this Office of Oceans, International Environment, Scientific Affairs, the Space Advanced Technology Office. And they're responsible for negotiating and approving international agreements that have to do with the civilian uses of space. So they work with a lot of folks from NASA and NOAA and scientific organizations from other countries to put those agreements in place. And I found a fellow remote sensing person in that office and we hit it off and I was able to support them on a number of tasks. In the management area, the Undersecretary of Management, as I mentioned, they're responsible for visas, passports, citizen services, budget, a lot of the mundane stuff, and also the Foreign Service Institute, which is a great resource for anyone who works at the Department of State. Um, they offer many, many courses. I took one called Washington Tradecraft, where I learned a lot about the history of how the Department of State works and how to, how to function within that environment. One of the other interesting things that they offer are language courses. And Foreign Service officers who are going to serve in a new country will often spend six to perhaps nine months learning a new language, nine to five every day, all throughout the work week at the Foreign Service Institute. So there's a lot of opportunities for education through that. As I mentioned, I was placed in the Office of Management Strategy and Solutions, and they're a relatively new office, and you can see their mission. They catalyze strategic insights and solutions to help improve the department's management platform and advance foreign policy goals. And that consists of three directorates, the Center for Analytics, Consulting and Advanced Projects, and Policy and Global Presence. I was in Consulting and Advanced Projects, and I'll explain a little bit more about that later, but I do wanna mention the Center for Analytics. This was stood up a couple of years ago, and really has brought to bear the idea of data-driven diplomacy within the Department of State. Uh, if you're interested, you can Google and find out more from press releases about CFA, but they are really working to bring together uh, stovepipe data and do cross uh, bureau analyses. There are about 50 data scientists that work in that Center for Analytics that are producing dashboards about 
you know, what's happening with 5G around the world and, and all kinds of information. They were very, very busy during the early days of COVID and continued to track the occurrence of the uh, outbreaks now. Within Consulting and Advanced Projects, there is a work stream called the Greening Diplomacy Initiative. And this was founded about 10 years ago by Secretary of State Hillary Clinton to improve the environmental sustainability of the Department of State's global operations. And there are a number of activities that they have, including a network of over 60 air quality monitors that measure the air, and, and I'll talk quite a bit more about that over the next 10 or 15 minutes, as well as use Internet of Things technologies to monitor energy usage at posts, they write reports, they coordinate these green teams at posts, and they present annual awards for sustainability. And just a little bit more about GDI, it was a great place for me to land. Of course, they were interested in me because of my background of environmental observations through satellites. But here's just some examples of how they promote um, resilience and sustainability through communications and activity. You can see this word up here, eco-diplomacy. Uh, I like that, and that's a part of their mission is to advance uh, ecologically friendly and sustainable activity and highlight how U.S. environmental technology can be used around the world. So before I get into the detail, just a brief overview of what I did. My first day of work, uh, everyone I worked with was like an eco-program analyst or an eco-manager and I got branded as the eco-technologist because I have this science and technology background. And uh, basically I served as a day-to-day -day science advisor on topics related to environmental monitoring or remote sensing. And there's a long list of things that I did, but uh, I just list a few of them here and then I'll go into some of the detail. I, my background in salary remote sensing has primarily been in looking at the Earth's surface and mapping out how the surface is used. I've done some temperature and humidity monitoring as well, the atmosphere. But the topic here they were really interested in is measuring air quality. And so I had to learn more about that. I helped coordinate the Virtual Air Quality Fellows Program. These are, uh, this year I think we have 30 scientists at local, state, federal agencies and universities who volunteer their time to work with embassies and consulates and advise them, do data analysis and advise them on air quality questions. We had a team that put together a challenge for the NASA Space Apps Challenge related to air quality, which is a, a weekend in October. It's coming up again this year in the general sense. It's a global event. It's a hackathon weekend where teams get together and work on specific topics. And we had 91 teams work on our surface to air quality mission space apps challenge. I'll talk more about our challenge 2020 in a moment. I went to a lot of meetings with NASA and NOAA and other agencies. I got to go to Australia and I'll talk more about that. And as I mentioned, I worked with OES SAT and put together for the first time ever a submission to a survey that is conducted by the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy on needs for satellite observations. And so we ended up submitting three needs from the State Department. I'll take just a, a minute here to talk about this last item. One of the few opportunities I had to work in kind of a diplomatic setting was to represent our work on air quality during an annual bilateral consultation, ABC, with Turkmenistan. And this was a phenomenal opportunity. The Turkmenistan delegation, which was headed by their foreign minister, came to the Department of State for a couple days of meetings um, back last fall. And I was asked to talk about the air quality work in a short segment that lasted about 90 minutes with them. So we go into this room, you know, we have eight Turkmen sitting on one side of the table. We have eight Department of State staff sitting on the other side of the table. And everyone's wearing a headset with uh, microphones and earphones because off to the side behind the glass wall in the room is a set of live 
translators. So everything that was said in their own language gets translated immediately and heard by everyone else in, the, in their headphones. And so it was very formal and very interesting. Uh, one little point, the United States uh, raised an issue that there had been NGOs commenting and speaking to the point that human rights were being violated as part of the cotton production in Turkmenistan. And, and the United States colleague of mine from the State Department was making a point of this. And when the foreign minister from Turkmenistan replied, you could tell he's very proud and in, indignant and said, why are you listening to these third party organizations? You should come and look. We have no violations. We treat our people very, very well. It was very, very interesting to see real time uh, diplomacy. Okay, so air quality. So the Department of State Monitor Network uh, started in 2008 in, in, in Beijing and has grown to now over 60 embassies and consulates. And the impetus for this and the use of the data is predominantly for the health and safety of the employees in those countries, but also to show that country what is the air quality data. These data are published uh, free and openly available through the EPA's airnow.gov website. And in particular, most of the monitors, or all of the monitors collect data on what's called particulate matter 2.5. And these are aerosols that are smaller than 2.5 microns in diameter. And they're particularly dangerous because these small particles can in get ingested into your lungs and actually go into your bloodstream and lead to effects like uh, heart attacks, um, predominantly from long-term exposure, but even short-term exposures can be hazardous. Of course, folks are much more aware of this now in, in the United States in the last few weeks because of all the wildfires going on out in, in the Western US. And in fact, as we are speaking right now through the end of the week, the National Academies are having a workshop on the health impacts of those wildfires. And some of the folks that I met throughout my time in Washington are, are leading the panel discussions on those workshops. Also on this chart is a uh, table of the air quality index, which shows the, a numerical scale that indicates the level of health concern. And you, if you go to the airnow.gov website and you click in the upper right where it says uh, US embassies and consulates, you can see a screen like this screenshot here in the upper right that shows the current air quality conditions at our embassies and consulates around the globe. The picture in the lower right is an example of the kind of equipment that's deployed at these locations. These are beta attenuation monitors, which work by collecting samples of the air, passing them through a tape, and, and the, the particles actually get caught on that tape, and they increase in density according to their concentration in the ambient air. And then that tape moves along, and there are some beta rays that get passed through there and, is, and then detected, and essentially the attenuation of those beta rays as they pass through this concentration of aerosols determines the measurement of what is the concentration in the ambient air. And so it's um, quite a process. It does provide a real-time measurement. There are other techniques that uh, involve collecting samples and then returning them to a laboratory, but these have the benefit of providing data on a real-time hourly basis. A little bit more about air quality. So according to the global burden of disease studies and, and other studies, poor air quality contributes to over 4 million deaths per year. In the United States, when the EPA was founded back in 1970, they defined uh, five gaseous or particle pollutants, including ozone, PM 2.5, and several other gases. And the way it, that air quality index works is you, there's a scale for each of those gases, and then they take the max, and that's the reported. It's almost always the PM 2.5. Um, and then these regulatory grade monitors and cost over $100,000. And so there's an emerging market in low cost sensors and individual consumers can buy these and place them outside their home or even in their home if they're interested in that. And the data are often sent back to a 
central cloud location. Some of the names of these are Purple Air, uh, Clarity, Aeroqual, and so on. However, these sensors can be inconsistent and you can have errors on the order of a factor of two. So when I came to the State Department at GDI, they said, well, you know about satellites. Can satellites provide you know, measurement uh, on a globe? Because we only have monitors at 60 embassies, but we have 180 posts and we'd like to, or, or more than that, we'd like to get information about some of the other areas. And so I spent a lot of time looking into that. Short answer, not really, almost, but it's, it's quite challenging. So before I talk about how you can do it from space, uh, let me talk a little bit about what happened this spring. As everybody knows, from March to June, many countries institute these mandatory lockdowns. And this led to a decrease in transportation and industrial activity. And a lot of places noted uh, reduced air pollution. So I uh, decided to go back and look at, and I found 20 of our monitors that had been operating in 2019 and also in 2020 were in cities that were affected by this lockdown. And so I started an analysis to compare the PM 2.5 concentrations from 2020 to 2019. And this graph in the lower right shows the daily average concentration in micrograms per meter cubed for New Delhi, in the embassy in New Delhi, India, with the orange being 2019 and the green being 2020. And you can see there's quite a decrease. So their lockdown started at the end of the March and went through the end of, end of June. So I'm going to continue to do this analysis and we'll hopefully present this at the fall AGU meeting to, to share with the community in a special session on the impacts of COVID on uh, air quality or the impact of the lockdown on, on air quality. Okay, so now let me shift gears and talk a little bit more about satellite remote sensing. It really began as an era 60 years ago with uh, the launch of the Tyros-1 satellite. But if you look at today, the image quality is much, much better. And here's a, a picture from the end of July taken by one of our GOES satellites. And I can just stare at these pictures all day. Uh, it's, this is God's creation. It's just so beautiful to see the colors and the patterns and so much can be learned by looking at it, these color images. But remote sensing is more than just looking at color images. And I put this chart together when I was preparing some other presentations that talk about the main modalities of how you can get information about surfaces from remote measurements. And these are the main ones with some others, gravity and magnetic fields uh, also be lumped in together. I'm not gonna go into great detail about these, but I do wanna point out that these kind of orange arrows show the path of energy and how it interacts with the atmosphere and the surface with these different kinds of modalities, whether they're passive, just receiving data, or they're active and they have their own source of energy. The sun is the biggest source of energy in, in our um, solar system and so it is a great tool to use and in fact the technology used to sense uh, surface PM 2.5 does take advantage of the solar illumination but that means that you can only measure it during the day and you also will know that that energy passes through the entire atmosphere can come off the surface clouds scattering in the atmosphere and pass up to the sensor Whereas the PM 2.5 that we really want to monitor is just a very thin layer near the surface. But the satellite's going to see contributions from the entire atmosphere along the way, and that's a complicating factor. Another aspect of satellite remote sensing is the platform location. The image I showed of the Earth that was so beautiful a few slides ago was collected by a geostationary satellite, which are in orbit above the equator and rotate at the same rate that the Earth does, so they appear to hang over a certain spot. But you can only see a uh, given hemisphere from one satellite. You need five or six to see the entire globe, but even then you miss the polar regions, and they're very, very far away. The low Earth orbit, polar orbiting satellites that you see are much closer, you can have higher resolution, and you can observe the entire globe. But as you see in this animation, they kind of map out a strip depending on how wide their field of view. 
and the soonest you can collect an image or data over the entire globe is about 12 hours. They move at seven kilometers a second, but it still takes 100 minutes to make an orbit around the Earth. And so the satellites that collect these polar orbiting data just get a single snapshot once per day in the daytime. Let's show a few examples of air quality as measured by satellites. And so here is one that uh, the type of data that received a lot of press early in the lockdowns. This was data collected by uh, the European Commission Sentinel program, Sentinel-5P with an instrument called TROPOMI. And it's measuring the column integrated nitrogen dioxide, one of those criteria pollutants. And you can see that the high levels are often concentrated around areas of industrial ac activity. And so this is one example that I took uh, last week as I was preparing this talk from a NOAA NESDIS website. Now, PM 2.5 cannot be measured directly, but it can be inferred or estimated from a quantity known as the aerosol optical depth. And here is a visualization of aerosol optical depth, again from a day last week, showing the patterns that's overlaid with the uh, cloud patterns from the satellite instrument. And one thing you can see here in the United States, there's a lot of this red or very high levels along the West Coast due to all the fires occurring out there, and then the transport over to the East Coast as well. And it's important to remind you that this measurement is of the entire atmosphere from the surface to where the satellite is above the atmosphere. And so the more work has to be done to retrieve that surface PM 2.5. I can't sh give a talk without showing at least one equation. And so here is a, a little bit of uh, detail from some training that was developed by my new friend, Pawan Gupta, who works at the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center down in Alabama, where he shows the relationship. First of all, the AOD is an integral of the extinction from the surface to the top of the atmosphere. And then the second equation shows one way you can relate that AOD to the surface PM 2.5 concentration using information about the scattering particles. Now, to go from AOD to PM 2.5, there's a number of techniques that have been investigated over the years. Initially, just a simple linear correlation, then multivariable uh, regressions, uh, artificial neural networks, and then an, a method that involves chemical transport models where you scale the uh, retrieved AOD by a relationship between, uh, that's produced by a chemical transport model. And I'll show some results of that uh, in a couple of slides. The great resource, in addition to the RCET training, is the HACAST website, NASA's Health and Air Quality Applied Sciences team. For, so for those of you who may be interested in the topic, I recommend that you uh, go visit that website. So what are some of the challenges? Well, there's many. I've talked about it's an integrated measurement instead of the surface. You've got clouds that get in the way. There's problems with bright surfaces and mixed land type. But just to show some of the results from the literature, so this table in the lower left looked at correlations between AOD and surface PM 2.5. And in particular, we can look at the linear correlation coefficient, which is down in that 0.5 or, or below. Not a real good relationship between what's retrieved by the satellite and what's measured on the ground. And another study, that, so that was just published this year, a study published last year, looked at a comparison of the daily average PM 2.5 at the um, embassy in New Delhi, as reported by OpenAQ. By the way, OpenAQ is a great resource. They compile, monitor data from all around the globe, and they have historical measurements available. Compared to what was retrieved from the satellite using this uh, chemical transport model scaling method. And here's the scatter plot. The, the cor linear correlation is only um, point, point 0.4 in, in this case. It's, it's really poor. And I put kind of the eyeball estimates of these different AQI categories. And you can see that in some cases, the 
uh, satellite data were saying, well, you know, it was a good measurement, but it was really very unhealthy. So it's not that only the fact that there is a great error, but you have a different interpretation of its impacts on uh, health. So this sort of represents a current kind of daily measurement, state of the art, of using satellites to get surface PM 2.5. It's really not there. But satellite data have been used for annual kinds of measurements and understanding long-term trends. And one of the organizations that has done a lot of work in this area is a group that uh, is out of Dalhousie University in Canada, led by Randall Martin, but who has recently moved to Washington University in uh, St. Louis. And they have produced these long-term data sets that look at annual mean surface PM 2.5. And so the top chart kind of shows the annual uh, concentration in micrograms per meter cubed. And you see some areas, uh, India, the Middle East, Northern Africa, China, that have uh, some pretty high levels. And I think I've seen statistics that something like 90% of the world's population live in areas that are above the um, WHO recommended standard of exposure to uh, PM 2.5, which is 10 micrograms per meter cubed for a year. What does the future hold? Well, there's some upcoming missions. And in particular, we've been working with the NASA and their Maya program, which will collect much more detailed data about the source apportionment, which means the types of aerosol particles, whether they're black carbon or organic carbon or sea salt or dust. And this will be making measurements in 12 primary target areas. But the neat thing about it is it's being conducted in conjunction with epidemiological medical studies. And I'll say more about that in the next slide. The other thing I mentioned that currently the PM 2.5 is estimated from polar orbiting satellites. But earlier this year and coming up in 2022, there's going to be a constellation of geostationary satellites which will make hourly measurements. And you can look at the monitor data and see that air quality varies throughout the day as you have activity ebb and flow in the area. And so by making that once per day snapshot, you're really getting a misleading value, which leads to some of the error in the estimates derived from satellite data. These instruments, which make hourly measurements, will do a much more a better job of capturing that diurnal variability. Unfortunately, some of these will not retrieve PM 2.5, but they'll be measuring these other gases, which turn out to be a lot easier because they have structural features that can be used to distinguish them more carefully. I mentioned the Maya. We're working together with them to help site instrumentation at these 12 primary um, observation sites but also we're helping them by shipping filters back and forth because some of the instrumentation has to come back to the United States for analysis. And this slide shows a little bit about the methodology of using the satellite, the ground monitors, a chemical transport model, and health records to try to associate the uh, specific exposure and the types of aerosols that folks are exposed to with the health effects. And so it's an exciting program to be involved with. Not only the measurement, but the forecast is of interest and import. And so here are two examples of a NASA and a European forecast model. Just like these models can be used to predict weather and whether it's going to rain or not and the temperature, the models can predict the concentrations of these pollutants. And these are just a couple examples. And you can see that these were for the same forecast period. There's a lot of similarities, but a lot of differences on a global scale between these models. And again, these models are not all that accurate as well. Uh, I just have a little reference here that uh, as part of this literature review, I'll be presenting a talk next week at the IGARS conference uh, virtually talking about how we looked at what is possible with satellites and the forecasting in support of the Department of State's missions. Okay, so that talks about the air quality and how to retrieve by satellite. Let me move on to some of the other activities. 
one of which was this Earth Challenge 2020. And this was an initiative launched by the Earth Day Network, the State Department, and the Woodrow Wilson Center to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And they set up a website and developed an app to really engage citizen scientists in collecting data and raising awareness of what can be done to improve sustainability in our environment. They had great plans for a huge event on the National Mall in celebration of Earth Day this year. Uh, back in January, I heard a rumor that TS was going to perform at the Earth Challenge 2020, you know, the Earth Day Network. And it's like, TS? Who's TS? Taylor Swift, maybe? I don't know. It was just a rumor. Uh, to find out more about this, you can go to the Earth Challenge 2020 website and download the app and become a citizen scientist yourself. So my involvement with this was just to advise a little bit. One of the areas they looked at was uh, air quality, and they developed this widget for the app where you could use your camera to calibrate it and then take a picture of the horizon. And then it collates that with a nearby EPA air quality monitor, or, or if you're in another country, whatever source of air quality data might be available. And they're building a database to extract the air quality based upon the photos. And I helped provide a lot of literature. A number of teams over the years around the world have attempted to do this. And there's a contractor working on building up these database and using this data. So uh, again, I would encourage folks to download the app and become a citizen scientist and support uh, Earth Challenge 2020. So down more to the travel line, I mentioned that I was able to participate as part of the United States Group on Earth Observation. And this is a picture of our, our team that went to Canberra, Australia for the Ministerial Summit. There's me hiding in the back, not trying to be too obvious. This was led, uh, this picture has Steve Bolts here, uh, who's the head of NESDIS. And it was a great opportunity to work, um, to meet and engage with environmental leaders from over 100 countries around the world. And I learned a lot more about citizen science, uh, big data, and how well we're delivering on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. So it was a, a wonderful opportunity. While I was there, I took advantage of being able to visit Embassy Canberra. And they had just recently won an award from our green team, from our Greening Diplomacy Initiative, in recognizing their efforts on enhancing the sustainability of Embassy Canberra. And so I met with Ambassador Culverhaus and Ali McKerney here, who was the leader of the green team, and presented this little uh, award in person to them. Uh, wonderful experience. Back in Washington, I had the honor and privilege of delivering a public lecture of my choice as part of being a Jefferson Science Fellow at the National Academies of Science, a state building. They're literally just across the street from the main state building on C Street in Washington. And you can see the title and what I chose to talk about and, and to share a little bit about some of the new applications and new technologies that are happening in remote sensing. And that, that was a lot of fun. Being located there, I was also able to attend many other public lectures and events, and, and one that I enjoyed the most was a special event at the National Academies that was in recognition of the 75th anniversary of Vannevar Bush's report called Science, the Endless Frontier, and this led to the founding of the National Science Foundation and heavy investment by the United States in basic science research. And they brought together leaders to discuss the future of US science policy. Folks like um, Francis Cordoba, who was the head of NSF at the time, and uh, Norm Abraham, uh, uh, Norm Augustine, who was a former CEO of Lockheed Martin, and, and uh, senators, and uh, Kevin Drogemeyer, who's the uh, head of uh, science at the White House. But the one speaker that I found most interesting was Alan Alda. Of course, he was Hawkeye on MASH and TV series. He has founded at Stony Brook a center for communicating science. And he spoke quite extensively about the need to communicate the importance and value of science 
and that program offers uh, scholarships for training and I would encourage scientists who may be interested to look into this uh, Center on Communicating Science. Okay, we're getting close to the end here, but just to uh, show a few more pictures, uh, I was fortunate enough to be in DC when the Nats won the World Series, and so I celebrated by wearing one of their t-shirts. Of course, I had my tie and, and blazer on, which was my uh, dress code of going to the State Department. Uh, met a lot of great people, had some nice social events out in Canberra. Uh, here's a picture of our GDI team enjoying a nice gathering socially distanced uh, this past summer. Uh, the fellows got together frequently for holiday parties. Uh, after each one of us gave our lecture, we would have a lunch to celebrate. And then in fact, uh, toward the end of my time in Washington, we got together for one of our last happy hours at uh, Hank's Oyster Bar on the DC Wharf. A little more casual here than the dress back in uh, earlier this year we were working. Uh, just a few more pictures. I have to show this one of the Roslyn Metro escalator. I went this, rode this escalator every day to work. I lived a few minutes from the Roslyn Metro station. It took two minutes and 37 seconds to go from the top to the bottom or the bottom to the top. This is the longest escalator I'd, I've ever seen. In fact, it, it took longer to ride the escalator than to ride the Metro from Roslyn to Foggy Bottom. Uh, while there, I got to go and see some wonderful sites around the area, including the Great Falls National Park and the Potomac. I got to ride on the Mount Vernon Trail, ride my bike, and I snapped this nice picture of seeing the Lincoln Memorial, the Washington Monument, and the Capitol Building all lined up uh, across the Potomac. And then uh, this is for my colleague Grover. Here's a picture of Albert Einstein outside the National Academy. It's a science building. I got to ride my bike all around there. Uh, it was a wonderful opportunity to get some exercise. Uh, on a personal level, this is actually the view from my apartment in, in Roslyn, which is in Arlington, Virginia. I was up on the 12th floor and got to look out uh, over it and I'm gonna blow up a little part of it. And just between a little peekaboo view of that Lincoln Memorial. And so I would always get some inspiration by looking at that each day. And as Dave mentioned, starting in March, I had to work from the apartment. And this is a view looking back. I didn't always wear a tie and, and suit at home, but this photo happens to capture it. Okay, so student opportunities. One I definitely want to highlight is there is a program that the State Department runs called the Diplomacy Lab, which presents challenges that State Department officials have to classes, which can be courses, independent study, or capstone. And so this is more toward faculty. And there are about 40 universities that have classes that work on these real world problems. In fact, I learned about this through my daughter because she was a student at American University and uh, she actually took one of these classes and did a study to help with uh, the um, development at uh, Afghanistan and actually had a meeting with the uh, officials from the Afghanistan embassy as part of their program. And so I'd like to encourage faculty who may have an interest to look into this program. There are many internship programs that State Department offers. There's one that's virtual called the Virtual Student Federal Service where you can do remote work. It's, it's unpaid, but can get you engaged in activities related to the State Department, as well as the Pathways Internship Program, which increasingly the State Department is supporting remote work. And so you don't necessarily have to go to Washington, although many are actually in Washington for the Pathways Internship Program. And then full-time employment, they don't just hire international diplomacy or international relations majors. There are many careers at the State Department for scientists and engineers even. I mentioned the data scientists, but I met many PhD level scientists working and providing their contributions to the Department of State. However, I should point out that all of these opportunities require US citizenship. For faculty, I, who knew this Department of State offers funding? 
And most of these are for educational, societal research, and capacity development, but there's some technical activities. So I think folks across universities should be aware that there are opportunities to get funding from the State Department to do research. And then in terms of the fellowships, as they mentioned, the Jefferson Science Fellowships applications are due October 16th. And you can get links to these from this uh, website or search on your own. Um, you can get up to 15,000 in stipend and 10 k of travel. Now there are 10 to 12 of these selected each year, but the AAAS actually runs a parallel program that places, I think it's around 200 PhD graduates in science and technology policy positions around the Washington area. There are about 40 to 50 at the Department of State and the others go to Congress or to other agencies. They're often early career, but they can be more late and, and senior persons as well. And they are directly paid by the Department of State or whatever organization. Those applications are due November 1st. And then there are a few professional science and engineering societies that have fellowships. The State Department has programs with American Institute of Physics and IEEE USA with the deadlines as shown. And with that, let me just speak briefly. I've gone a little bit over on time, but lessons learned. There's a lot of really good, dedicated, hardworking staff in our government that are motivated to represent the United States and advance our interests as best they can. I really was impressed by the folks that I worked with. Life at the State Department centers around relationships. And no surprise, but it really came through. And in the era of remote work, it's a bit of a challenge, but uh, while working at the office, people had coffee chats and all kinds of interactions. Uh, it's really about people. But scientific evidence-based advice has an important role. And I was very encouraged. The scientists that I met uh, were, for the most part, uh, heard and listened to, maybe the policy officials didn't always act on the advice that they got, but it definitely was appreciated. And, and I can say that science does have a voice in the, in the State Department. And lastly, just to say that the, the world is really much smaller and more connected than we often believe. Um, you know, this tendency toward isolationism and nationalism, this ship has sailed. Uh, the global society is here and uh, that really, was sent home during my time at the State Department. And I'm gonna wrap up with just one last little comment in terms of their, their seriousness and dedication. They, but we're also very excited to have me work with them and to go to places like NASA and talk about satellites. They, they really enjoyed that. And they, they were, but just were always so serious that they just, you know, never want to joke about satellites because it's always over their head and they never land. With that, I'd be glad to happy, happy to answer any questions that may have. Thank you, John. Very nice. Thank you very much. I will, I will throw in here at the end that John is, is, um, is also being characteristically modest. And I learned from his sabbatical report that in the spring, um, he was one of 30 individuals across the State Department to receive a meritorious honor award. Um, and the citation read for advancing the Department of State's knowledge and abilities in the field of remote sensing and for developing partnerships with NASA, EPA, and others, leveraging satellite data for air quality. So John's work was not only interesting and, and uh, exciting for him, but he obviously had a very strong impact on his colleagues at the State Department as well. Um, so thank you very much, John. If there are any questions, if somebody can, you can either raise your hand in the, in the, in the Zoom window and I'll, I'll call you out, or if you type it into the chat room, I'm staring at both of those things right now. And we do have another few minutes for questions if somebody has anything. And I'll just say that uh, my email is easy to find in the web and I'd be happy to have further dialogue with folks who may be interested in learning more about some of the things that I spoke about today. All right, well, I'm not really seeing anything right now in the, in the chat room or anybody raising their hand. John, thank you very much for the talk. Um, oh wait, 
Uh, Tony Vodacek says, thanks, John. I noticed dust seemed to be a big 2.5 item. Yeah, dust is one of the components. And in terms of the satellite observations, we can see that directly looking uh, at um, the dust coming from Northern Africa in the Sahara. Uh, a lot of, there was a big dust storm that occurred. Some of you may recall, I think it was earlier this summer that caused mm -hmm. um, beautiful sunsets in the Caribbean and other places. And so the, um, uh, dust is one of the components that is modeled in the forecast and contributes to the measurements. So it's certainly part of it. All right. Um, thank you very much, John. Thank you for educating us also about all the opportunities to continue to work with state, both for faculty and for students at the research and internship level. And um, again, if anybody has any questions about the Jefferson Science Fellow, please, please reach out to John. You've got about three weeks to get that application in if you're interested. Thank you very much, John. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. John's the best. <laughs> that was my host. <laughs> I was going to say that. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> She's the one that uh, told me the joke about the satellites. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> I did it, Caroline. <laughs> All right. Thanks, John. Great crowd, great presentation. Thank Thanks, you Dave. Much. We'll be in touch. Yep.